I've done a lot of things with Minecraft mobs on this channel nowadays, from turning them into superheroes to turning them into xenomorphs a few times, even making them into fantasy armors, but it all started with Minecraft mobs as fantasy beasts. Today's video is a compilation of the first four videos in that series because at the time you're watching this, I'm on vacation. So no fresh new content today, but it would be greatly appreciated if you could hit the like button on this video so that it doesn't get buried by the algorithm and the channel doesn't take a dip while I'm on vacation. But whether you've already seen all of the videos in this episode before or you're coming to this fresh and haven't seen them, I hope you enjoy what's to come. Let's go. Hit like if you want, subscribe if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. In my ever-continuing search to discover all I can about the dragons, beasts, and creatures of this world, I'd long heard tales of a mysterious set of isles, where live a colony of miners who build incredible structures from the spoils of their environment, but who simultaneously must fend off their own unique breeds of monsters that only exist on these islands. Finally, after years of questioning those who had allegedly visited these lands, I was finally able to charter a boat to go and visit for myself, to see these creatures and these people with my own eyes. It was a three days journey by boat, and when I arrived, surprisingly, the people were very welcoming, and there were far more of them than I ever could have imagined. And while I could certainly go into extensive detail about their ways of life and the incredible towers, castles, and villages they've crafted, I'll avoid digressing and step right into an analysis of the first creature, unique to these islands, that I was able to witness, the Jutting Sea Guard. This species of vicious fish stretches to about the length of a full-grown human. It has a green, scaly hide, and a set of three-foot-long jutting spikes that can stab out of it like a pufferfish to impale prey or opponents. The creatures tend to reside near sunken temples or monuments, where they act almost like guards to these once sacred places, hence their names. They can be quite hostile towards any islanders who make their way near their waters, and while they may not be as monstrous or beastly as, say, a riptide ocean drake or a calamitous squid, if you come across a few in a pack, you could very likely meet a quick and violent end. While I wasn't able to spot one in my time on the islands, the locals also told me of a larger breed of these creatures, with a paler body who's even more vicious than the fish that I saw. I hope to come back again at some point and witness one of these, but for the time being, I'm quite satisfied with the range of creatures that I was able to observe. I'll go into details of more creatures in a moment. Now, if you end up liking the way that I did the environments and backgrounds in this episode, you can thank Cohen Calmer for that, the godfather of the Popcross Community Discord, which, by the way, recently passed 10,000 members. Thanks to everyone in it and all the awesome work of the moderators. But anyway, I really, really love all the art in this episode, and I think a large part of the reason why is because I did just put a bit more time and effort into the environments and backgrounds. As I'm one to do, I took a course on Skillshare that just helped me flesh out my ideas of how to do environments a little bit more. But really, all I changed for my new process for environments is just you know, spending a little bit more time on them. But even with that, it wasn't that much more time. Like, this first drawing only took two hours. Whereas lately, my drawings usually average around three and a half hours. And I think this is one of my favorite finished drawings I've done on the channel in ages. But yeah, thanks for the push, Cohen, and I hope you all like the first creature in our Minecraft Monsters episode. Here it is. The next creature I witnessed was one that apparently is far more rare to see, and only comes out when enough people on the islands have been deprived of sleep for a while, whether that be from overworking a crop yield or what have you. My hypothesis as to why this is the case is that the creatures may be attracted to the scent of increased blood sugar levels in the islanders, something that can come as a result of not sleeping enough. Though, the islanders have a legend that says it's the creatures coming to claim those who do not respect their earthly bodies enough to rest them properly. Regardless of the reason, when the colony is overworked and underrested, the skeletal phantos comes out to scourge the knights. The islanders also claim that these creatures are undead phantoms, and while I personally doubt the legitimacy of this claim, I can certainly see how they've drawn that conclusion. These creatures seem to be breeds of amphipteers, those being dragons with wings but no arms or legs. 
But while much of the Phantos' bodies are covered in blue and tan skin, large sections of their tails seem to be exposed skeletons, and their rib cages appear on the outsides of their bodies, giving them a very undead look. I was unable to find a deceased one to examine it myself, so it is possible that what appears to be a skeleton is actually some form of external armored plating, but regardless, these creatures were an eerie sight to behold. On top of all that I've described so far, they also had glowing green eyes, which provided the main way for us to spot them in the night. Now that they've been spotted a few nights in a row in the area, the communities here are encouraging all of their residents to get a fuller night's sleep. While work does need to get done, that will be far easier to do if nights aren't being spent fending off skeletal beasts. Now of all the drawings in this episode, this is the one that took the longest, but even it only took about 3 hours and 10 minutes or so, and a bunch of that just came down to me messing around with the position of the wings and the tail, there was just something a little bit off about it. And I think overall, the pose is better than what I'd started with, it's still, you know, a little bit iffy, I could have done something slightly more interesting with the wings. But that's pretty much my only complaint about this piece. Overall, I really do like how it looks. Although I guess another complaint could be, and I don't know how much is this just me nitpicking, but like with a few other drawings in this episode, you don't get that much of a sense of scale. Because he's kind of just floating in the air with some close and some distant mountains, it could really be any size. It could be massive or smaller. And because I made the head smaller than the Phantom's head is in the actual game, that makes this creature feel bigger. But I don't know, again, that's just me kind of nitpicking because I need something to talk about for the art portion of this. Overall, I'm really pleased with it. I was trying to make it not look too much, like, toothless from How to Train Your Dragon because when I looked at the original design of the Phantom, for some reason, that was really spiraling around in my head. And I feel like you can definitely get some vibes of that design and how I shaped the head. But overall, I don't think I made it too similar to toothless. Quite pleased with how this one turned out, and I hope you all like it as well. Might have to do the Ender Dragon if I do another episode of this, but for now I'm very glad I decided to pick the Phantom. Here it is. The next creature was one I witnessed all too often while exploring the islands. They seem to be the most common of the hostile beasts in the land, and even when you can't see one nearby, you often won't go a day without hearing one erupt in the distance. You see, the creeping bombardiers are four-legged green creatures whose main form of attack seems to be exploding, killing themselves and anyone who's gotten too close. Once again, the islanders have a legend about these creatures, that being that one of their deities, Notch the Almighty, had been trying to create a form of pig to live on the island, and had been distracted by ancient meddling miners trying to mine the mountain on which he was doing his work. In his distracted state, he created the creeping bombardier instead of the pig he was trying to make, and he imbued it with its explosive power to punish the miners who'd kept him from successfully doing his work. Well, it is rare to come across creatures who have some form of self-destructive ability as a defense mechanism, it's not wholly uncommon. For instance, the most obvious case is the female honeybee. When it stings someone in defending its home, it then dies immediately after. But a creature that stands at the same height as an average human, like these beasts, having this form of defense is fairly unusual. While these creatures may sound incredibly dangerous, the islanders are so used to them that they hardly seem to be a threat. When one is getting too close to a village or colony, they'll often go and get it and kill it, or force it to activate its explosive abilities while everyone is at a safe distance from it. They cause the biggest threat in the rare cases where one is struck by lightning. The lightning seems to supercharge their explosive capabilities, making them far harder to safely detonate. Once more, the islanders told me that there were other elemental breeds of these creatures, but on this first visit to the island, I was not able to see more. Though admittedly, I was not eager to see more of these creatures. I got more than enough time witnessing this breed on my time in the islands. Now, the other day my dad asked me, but lots of people have probably noticed by now I'm working from my parents' cottage for a few weeks, that's why the videos are in a different setting, but while here my dad asked me what my favorite drawing I'd ever done was, and I couldn't really think of an answer at the time. I said maybe the SCP-999 drawing, but that one the background is a graphic design background, which I really like doing, not a hand-drawn background. And I think now, overall, I might have to say that this is my favorite drawing I've ever done on the channel. 
Like the design of the character is really simple, but I think fleshed out enough that it's interesting. The green of the ground and back going up, making a triangle with the green of the character makes the composition work really well. And then there's enough space around his head and the clouds that are sort of faded a bit work kind of like speed lines that bring us into the character and make it feel like there's a little bit of movement to it. I don't know, just everything about this piece came together so nicely, and I can't express how much I love that I can do a drawing that I like this much in 2 hours and 45 minutes. Because often I feel like I have to put tons and tons of work into a drawing to make it look great, but this one, I used most of my art know-how in 2 hours and 45 minutes to make this, which I'm super happy with. Anyway, I might be hyping this one up a little bit too much, but you can all decide what you think of it now too. Let's take a look at the finished result. The final creature I'm logging is one that I can still hardly believe I was able to witness. Not solely for its unusual biology, but also for the place I had to go to see it. The islanders led me to a black gateway, inside which was a glowing purple energy. I'd only once seen something similar to this energy, that being the light produced by my friends Kayla and Charlie when they came to my world from another realm. The portal, once I stepped through it, led us to a musty, expansive cavern realm full of spilling pools of magma. The islanders occasionally go down there to mine, but there is much to be wary about in that place. Most notably so were the ghastly pale flames. These creatures resemble massive jellyfish, but with more opaque skin. The one I witnessed for a brief time was about six times the size of a full-grown human and had stained flesh that looked almost as though it had spent much time crying. While the creatures are rather weak once attacked, they are particularly dangerous for their ability to float at a distance and spit bursts of flame at their prey. Though admittedly their flight capabilities are what intrigued me most, as there was no apparent reason for why they were able to fly. Like the soaring Saigon or the orbital marvel, these creatures were able to sustain flight without the use of wings or other such appendages. I'd be curious to see if they could sustain flight in another environment. Maybe something about the place they live helps them stay airborne, but I doubted that any of the locals would be alright with me goading one of these creatures through the portal to observe them back above. We didn't spend long in this molten nether realm, and in general my time on the islands felt all too short, but I am certainly eager to visit again and log more of the fantastic and dangerous creatures that haunt the lands that these remarkable miners and crafters live on. Now this drawing while I'm putting it at the end of the video is actually the very first one I drew, and something you'll notice about how I did the environment in this one is I used a more textured brush, and it's actually more similar to how I did my drawings for the Kaiju Slayer episode, where I was first messing around with doing more fleshed out backgrounds and environments. The textured brushes can work well for making things look more rough and rugged or depending on what you want to do with them and what kind of textured brush you're using, but I think for my art style it just doesn't work quite as well. Maybe it would work better if I experiment with it more and flesh it out a little bit more, but in the other drawings I was using a more similar texturing process to what I do with my characters, and I think that makes for a more unified piece. Again, that's a small nitpick thing, I really like how this drawing turns out in general. The thing I thought about most when doing the background was how much to flesh out the area right behind the creature's head and body. Usually with other creatures, I'll leave the area right behind their head blank with sky or water or whatever, so we're not obstructing the silhouette of the focal point of the character. But with this one, because he's in a cave, there had to be some kind of rocks or environment behind him. So I just kind of made the area behind his head a little bit, you know, slight, vague, rocky shapes, and then put a bit of a red aura around him to make sure he was really standing out from the environment. I think it ended up being a really good balance and I'm really pleased with how this drawing turned out overall. And I hope you are all as well. Let's take a look at the finished result. For weeks past my time spent on the mysterious isles of the mining colonies, I couldn't stop thinking about what else there could be to discover there. So I once more decided to return, and it seemed like the perfect time to arrive as an interesting event was transpiring there. 
A villager who'd recently turned 18, Stephen the Bold, was training to be the new captain of the island guard. It seemed he'd been charged with hunting down a few of the more nefarious creatures on the island as trials to prove himself. So naturally, following his exploits was a perfect opportunity to safely witness some of the more dangerous creatures to be found in the region. His first task, after my arrival, was to fight off a group of an unusual species of merfolk, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. The drowned sea skulkers are humanoid appearing but animalistically minded creatures who frequently attack islanders that get too close to them or their waters. The islanders claim that these creatures are undead. They also made this claim about the skeletal phantos on my last voyage here, and it seems they believe this to be true about many creatures in the area. And while I was initially skeptical, later events on this voyage would make it difficult for me to believe that their claims were false. Regardless of the origins of these creatures though, they continued to fascinate me as Stephen hunted down a group that had come too close to the waters near a local village. Despite being a fairly unintelligent species, some did wield weapons, specifically tridents. I asked one of my guides where they came across such weapons, and the guide claimed that the creatures simply came into being with the tridents. While my guides were very pleasant and gracious, I did at times find their information a bit unhelpful, as I highly doubt this claim to be true, though this whole trip has made me question many things. Anyway, the final interesting note of these creatures is how sensitive their skin is to the sun. Steven managed to lure one of them onto land, and not long after stepping onto the surface, its skin began to bubble, then smoke, and finally burst into flame. It tried to return to the water soon after, but Steven made quick work of it before it could. They'll apparently come onto land more readily at night and are safe then, but waiting to witness that event wasn't an option. Stephen the Bold had dealt with the creature and then he was off to face another task. Now with this drawing, overall I really like how it turned out, but there's two things about it that are a little bit iffy to me. One is the nose of the creature. I tried to make it a little bit more zombie-like and a bit more skeletal, but it turns out a little bit pig-like, which definitely wasn't the intention. And then also just the giant seaweed that I put around the character kind of messes up the sense of scale, which is something I talked about in the last episode as sort of a problem with some of the art in these episodes. It makes this guy feel like he's really, really tiny because the seaweed is supposed to be massive, but it looks like it could just be regular seaweed. Hopefully that doesn't bother other people too much, as I said besides that, I like how most of this turned out. And my favorite thing about it is probably the textures I put on the character, the cuts in his skin and the mossy growth growing on him, and his tattered clothes, I think all of that turned out really well. Anyway, let's take a look at the final result of our drowned creature. The next endeavor I followed Steven on was to hunt down a creature I'd heard tales about during my last trip to the Isles, but nobody had been willing to take me to find. But now Steven was looking to not only hunt down one, but twelve, the reason for which I'd discover later. These creatures are called the Lank-Limbed Enders, and the first of them that we found was alarmed by the lantern that I carried. It turned towards us when the light struck it, and once it made eye contact with me, it charged. Stephen, of course, intervened and struck the creature with his diamond-carved sword, but partway through the battle, in a burst of purple floating specks, the creature vanished. It had teleported to a cliff ledge in the distance, where three more of the creatures had gathered. I was worried at first, but Stephen proved to be more than enough for these creatures, even refusing my help when I reached for my own blade. Over the next few hours, I witnessed Steven slicing through many of these creatures and I learned everything I could about them in that time. But the first most significant note about them was their teleportation ability. I witnessed this bizarre supernatural form of movement many times over those hours, and I can now no longer claim it to be an impossible feat. When I'd years ago studied the Germanic cave crawlers, who seemingly vanish in puffs of smoke, I stated that it was unproven whether they actually could transport their bodies in a blink. But upon seeing the lank limbs move, I'm now much more inclined to believe that it's true. Luckily, while these creatures are hostile as soon as a human looks them in the eyes, they are fairly easy to ward off as long as you're close to water. As soon as these creatures make contact with water, they'll transport away, and when it rains, they'll spend the duration of the storms in their caves. 
They don't eat or sleep, and the only activity they seem to partake in is digging up rocks or patches of dirt and moving them around for no apparent reason. Everything about these creatures was indeed strange, but possibly most so was that when they're slain, their bodies dissolve into ash, and all that remains is a black eye-like pearl. These were what Steven was truly after in slaying the creatures. When he had 12 of these pearls, we headed back to his village, where a few bizarre rituals were waiting for us. Now the Enderman was by far the most requested mob from the last episode, so I knew I had to do him for this episode and I was excited to work with him, but also a bit nervous because he's so simple design-wise. I mean, lots of the mobs are very simple design-wise because they're all just a few blocks stacked together, but this guy in particular I was like, I guess I'm just drawing a really tall, lanky, long-armed man with purple eyes? The other design element that I latched onto was what he looks like when his mouth is open, because when he runs at people his mouth opens up and you can see through his mouth in the game and I considered doing that but it didn't really seem like it was going to work out for the design I wanted to make. But I did try to make the shape of his mouth similar to the shape of his mouth in the game. To make this thing a little bit more fantasy looking, almost to make it look like some kind of elven ghoul, I gave it the elf sort of ears, and I don't know if that was the right choice for the Enderman, but overall pretty happy with how this one turned out, so I don't really mind the ear thing. By the way, there won't be design notes for the next two characters, because I have longer lore for the bosses. Anyway, let's take a look at the Enderman design. When we returned to his village, some of the other islanders took the orbs that Stephen had claimed from the lank-limbed enders to prepare for his final test. But before that, he would be made to face down a creature that made the lank limbs seem normal in comparison. A few villagers had recently returned from the Nether Plain, a place that I'd traveled to on my last adventures here where I witnessed the ghastly Pale Flame. They returned with the heads of some skeletal creatures from that realm, and some barrels full of sand. I was awestruck by how much sand and supplies each of the villagers was able to carry, but that oddity would be nothing compared to what they'd do with what they'd gathered. They piled up the sand and placed the three heads all next to each other on the stack. Steven was now fully clad in armor and standing ready for some kind of battle. All the other villagers backed away and an elder stepped forth and chanted something while waving a jewel-coated pickaxe over the skulls. A moment later, the mass shifted and lifted off the ground. The eyes and mouths of the heads began to glow white, and the sand shifted and solidified into a floating skeletal body for the now awakened heads. This monstrosity, Stephen's next test to prove his ability to protect the islanders, was a withering skull spewer. It's a creature that can only come into existence when summoned, and it is brought forth in cases like this to test those in Stephen's position. The whole village was made to stand on the edge of the battleground, and Stephen had to both kill the creature and protect all the villagers. I was so alarmed by the whole event that I may have missed some details about the creature's attributes, but here is what I learned after it spawned. The Skull Spewer, as its name suggests, spits bursts of flame and smoke that appear similar to skulls. A smoking blue skull struck Steven partway through the battle, and that blow seemed to do more damage than anything else, leaving Steven tired and disoriented, and his eyes seemingly glazed over with a coat of black but he did push through whatever that skull had done to him. Steven used a bow and arrow against the creature for the first while of the battle, matching its own ranged attacks, but once he'd injured the beast enough, its body began to glow blue, and it seemed like the arrows were then just bouncing off its glowing aura. He then had to strike the creature up close with his diamond blade. The creature seemed to take endless strikes with very little effect, the battle went on and on, but eventually Steven did land a final blow, and like the lank limbs, this creature dissolved into ash as it died. Steven had proven himself in this task, but there was still one more trial to come. I 
I barely slept that night, spending most of my time questioning many of the things I thought I knew about what was possible from the creatures of my world. But more strangeness was still to come with Steven's final test the following day. In the morning, I followed him and some others to an underground temple, where stood a gateway, like the one I'd taken to the nether on my last trip here, but not quite the same. Eleven of the orbs that had been dropped by the length-limbed enders that Steven had collected had been placed around the gateway, and when we arrived, the twelfth was laid down. A portal opened and I followed Steven through it to a dark realm where I could quickly see dozens of lank limbs wandering about. But we weren't there for them. We traveled through the realm till we found a set of tall black pillars, at the top of which were glowing purple beacons, and circling in the sky above them was a glowing-eyed black dragon. This was Steven's final test. He had to slay the Violet Maud Ender Beast. Like the Skull Spewer, this creature could be spawned by the Islanders via a ritual, once more undertaken to test a would-be guardsman. And while it would certainly be a difficult trial for one man to defeat alone, it was actually a fairly basic looking dragon compared to others I've seen in my travels. It spat purple flames and was not afraid to get close to Steven to strike him, but Steven's blows back actually seemed to do more damage to this creature than they had to the Skull Spewer. The thing that made this trial most difficult was it seemed when the dragon flew close to the purple beacons on top of the pillars, it would heal its wounds. This meant Steven had to scale the pillars and destroy destroy the beacons before he could slay the beast properly. And so Steven's main tactic became that he'd wound the dragon so it would need to fly around the beacons to heal, then in that time he'd use two pickaxes to scale the towers and destroy the beacons. But a few times the creature attempted to hit him off of the pillars, making it a very treacherous task. Luckily, he was able to strike a few of them with arrows from afar, and so eventually he did manage to destroy all of the beacons. Then it finally came time to slay the creature. Steven leapt from the final tower and landed on its back. He sliced through its wings with his sword, and the creature flopped towards the ground. It crashed and Steven was flung from its back, dropping his sword. He then drew one of his pickaxes and ran at the downed creature. Just before it could spit another burst of violet flames, he drove the pickaxe straight through its head. The beast thrashed as its entire body began to glow purple. Soon after, it erupted in light and a shower of ashes. Once the beast was slain, a portal appeared in the ground, and we were able to take it back to the island. There, Stephen the Bold was praised for his cunning and bravery. He was properly made captain of the Island Guard, a title he truly deserved. And of course, I was left with a much more vast appreciation of the incredible people and creatures to be found on this truly bizarre set of islands. It had been quite some time since I last returned to the Mining Colony Isles. Last time I was there, Stephen the Bold had just completed his trials to become captain of the Island Guard, and he extended an invitation for me to return at any time. Finally, I took him up on that offer. When I arrived at Stephen's village, they were just in the middle of completing a ritual. There was a carved iron statue in the midst of a circle of villagers, while one woman, stepped just inside the circle, was chanting and carrying a large pumpkin. She smashed the pumpkin at the feet of the statue, and just as she did, cracks erupted along its body, splitting creases at its joints. The statue began to move. It stretched out its limbs, then simply looked calmly down at the crowd before it. The people all cheered, then eventually parted ways, leaving the now animated statue to slowly meander about the village. I heard of these creatures on my last voyage here, but hadn't had the pleasure of seeing one in person. I found Stephen and asked him to remind me of what these creatures could do. He said they were called the Iron Guard Sentinels. They were a breed of golems specific to the island, crafted from a special kind of iron that can only be found on the Mining Colony Isles. They were very durable and capable fighters, built to aid the guards in protecting the villages from invaders or unwanted creatures. But most of the time, these sentinels simply wander about the villages they were forged in, giving people a sense of ease, and even sometimes picking flowers and presenting them to the children of the village. It's not often that they'll have to spring into action to protect people, and yet I just so happened to be present when one of these cases arose. 
Now, fun fact that I'm quite sure I didn't say in the last episode, the second Minecraft Monsters episode, I actually drew an iron golem for that episode, but I cut it out because I didn't think it was good enough. I'd done five drawings, so I was just like, ah, I can just cut this one and maybe redo it at a different time. And I'm glad I did that because now I get an opportunity to do a better job of it now. But looking back at the drawing I'd done then, which I'll show you here, I don't think it's any worse than the other drawings from that episode. I think it's fine. Looking back at those first two Minecraft Monsters episodes, I think the first one is great and holds up well. And the second one, I think the lore for it's fun, but the art is... Eh, it's okay. But it's always fun doing a distant sequel, doing a sequel to an episode a long time after I did the previous one, like when I did my third episode of Avengers as Dragons. I then get to look back at how much my art has evolved from those previous episodes. I'm actually using a bunch of the design ideas that I'd used for the last time I drew the Iron Golem as a monster, but I'm making this one a lot more textured and rough looking, a little bit more beaten up. I'm taking inspiration from some of my Fantasy Armor episodes, but also trying to make sure this looks a little bit more like a natural creature. I'm almost taking a bit more inspiration from stone golems for it, while also trying to give it a little bit more of a forged sort of look. And I think I strike that balance decently well. Hope you all agree, let's take a look at how it turned out. Not long after the new Iron Guard Sentinel had been forged, the village was attacked. A hostile clan that has never let me close enough to ask them anything about their lifestyle on my previous ventures here attempted a raid on Steven's village. The Sentinel, along with the village's guard and with my assistance as well, were all more than enough to ward off the attackers, but after the initial waves of soldiers retreated, there was a loud horn that blew in the distance. Then, down the trail headed straight towards the town came a rampaging beast. It was much like a bull, but twice the size. It was adorned in spike armor plating and had a larger mouth than most bovine creatures. This was a ravaging dire bull, a common mount of the hostile clans of the Isles. This one had no rider, but came towards us all the same. I was ready to move in and headed off before it reached us, but Stephen put a calm hand on my shoulder and told me to let the Iron Guard do its job. The golem stomped forth and attacked the beast itself. Early on, the battle seemed fairly even, with the dire bull even driving its horn through the golem's torso plating. But, as the brawl went on, it got more one-sided, with the sentinel having a clear upper hand. The golem even managed to lift the bull above its head, then slam it down into the dirt. It did this multiple times until, finally, the dire bull stopped getting back up. Villagers moved in to harvest the creature's hide, and the woman who'd forged the iron golem in the first place began to patch up the damage caused by the battle. It was a fascinating event to witness, but far from the strangest thing I'd observe on this third bout around the Isles. Now with this drawing, I really, really like how it turned out, but also think I probably could have made it a little bit more monstrous. I really like the rendering and the pose, but, you know, it kind of does just look like a really big bull. Which is fine, that's kind of what the Ravager is, but, you know, I could have made it a little bit more menacing looking, I think. Also, usually with my specific Minecraft episodes, I try to only use Minecraft mobs that I haven't used before. But since I'm onto my third Minecraft Fantasy Monsters episode, and I've done two Minecraft Super Heroes episode, I've used most of the cool mobs, in my opinion anyway. So now I'm just like, ah, I can go back and reuse some that I haven't used in this specific series before. So I have done the Ravager as a superhero in the Minecraft Superhero series, but hadn't used it for this and thought it would be a fun one to draw in this episode. And I'd say I was right, kind of detoured in what I was talking about there because I don't have much else to say about this drawing, but yeah, overall, I still like how it turned out. Let's take a look. Since my last venture to the Isles, the colony had actually made a strange discovery. While expanding their mines farther down into the depths of the earth, they broke through to a massive underground ancient city. It baffled them as they had nothing in their scrolls or tales about which clan's ancestors may have lived there, but unfortunately they also couldn't spend much time down there studying their remains. This was because of a species of creature they found down there that they'd never seen before. 
It's a type of beast with no eyes that traverses the caves led by its hearing and sense of smell. Making noises any louder than quiet footsteps can lure the creature towards you, so it's very unsafe to stay down in the deep dark caverns. These creatures can even dig up through solid stone and can be struck so many times without showing any sign of injury that even in large numbers, fighting them is not worth the risk. These are the Rumbling Cavern Wards. Named as such for the rumbling, gurgled calls and cries they make, which seem dual purpose, both to intimidate, but also to send echoing waves of sound through the caverns to help their traversal. While we likely could have lured one out by simply being down in the deep dark caverns long enough, Stephen had a quicker way. He and I located a strange green mold that was growing over some of the rocks, and from it had spawned a four-pronged plant. Steven struck this plant three times, and it sent an echoing sound through the caves. We then moved aside and stayed as still as possible. Somehow, the caves seemed to get suddenly far darker, so we could barely see a few inches in front of our face. Soon, the only thing illuminated was the 16-foot-tall, ogre-like beast lumbering towards the plant. The creature was fascinating to look at. It was mostly green, but had glowing antennae and an exposed glowing stomach, surrounded by jutting teeth. I was grateful Steven had been willing to lure the thing out to show me, but we didn't stay long, as fighting the creature, with the little known about it, wasn't viable, even with both our combat skills combined. We moved as slowly and silently as possible until we were a ways away from the creature, then sprinted back up through the tunnels to safety. This was the piece that I knew I was going to have the most fun with. First of all, it was the creature that was most requested to use, but also I knew the lighting was going to be a blast for this one because I wanted to have it set in a cave, have it really dark, and have the only source of lighting being the warden's stomach and, and I guess it's antennae. I do cheat the lighting a little bit because the hand that's reached out towards us probably wouldn't be as well lit as I have it here. I kind of make it as though the light is in front of the hand and below it a bit, whereas the stomach is obviously behind the hand. But if I'd done it properly, more realistic lighting, then that hand would be a lot darker and it just wouldn't look as good. So this is one of those cases where cheating it a little bit, I think, is for the better for the piece. Partway through the piece, I also noticed that it was looking a little bit too uniform color-wise. I wanted something to stand out a little bit more and maybe help us draw our eyes towards its face. So when I did the saliva in its mouth that I do with a lot of my weird, creepy kinds of creatures, I changed it to red and made it a bit more like blood, even though I didn't really write anything into the lore about you know, this creature eating people, but uh, I'm still happy with that. Like the lighting with the hand, I think it just kind of helps the piece be a little bit better. Also, doing this drawing prompted me to do the weird, creepy bonus episode that I have coming out on Wednesday. But the stuff in that is a lot creepier than how this guy looks, I think. Very happy with how this one turned out. I hope you all like it as well. Let's take a look. For the final entry to my bestiary from this journey, we had to return to the realm I'd visited with the villagers the first time I'd come to the Isles. We stepped through their purple portal and found ourselves in the volcanic, cavernous nether realm. There are many hostile creatures in this area, some of which I've explored before, but the one I studied on this journey was actually a rather calm and peaceful species. The striding lava stretch appears somewhat like a blend of a blue whale and an ostrich, but with dark orange skin. It's but a large head with legs and some very thick strands of hair. It resides in the actual lava of this strange place. They stride through the lava on their long legs and spend so much time immersed in it that their lower legs are crusted over in hardened molten rock. Some of the braver villagers actually use these creatures as mounts to move across the pools of lava to reach farther parts of the nether. I thought this was an outrageous risk to take as all that would need happen was the creature trip and the rider could fall to a very painful death, but many in the group didn't even think twice about it. The villagers have found it very easy to direct these creatures while riding them by simply holding mushrooms and fungus out in front of them on fishing lines that the creatures will then walk towards. They're clearly not a particularly intelligent species of creature, but that doesn't make them any less fascinating. In our time down there, we did find a deceased one, and I took the opportunity to gather some of its hide. 
A creature with skin tough enough to withstand striding through lava seemed like a fantastic material to eventually have crafted into armor. In fact, on my last day of this third journey to the Isles, I gathered up a few segments of hides of the various creatures from the Isles, before once more saying my goodbyes and taking my leave from this fascinating region of my world. I feel like in a lot of my dragon and fantasy monster episodes lately, I'm making Tayrin come across a bit like an armor addict. Because <laughs> I just, I now that I have the fantasy armor series set in the same world, and he knows Vasilia Kuznet, the character that crafts all the fantasy armors, I, anytime I'm doing a monster episode, I'm like, ooh, you know what? This monster would be really cool turned into a fantasy armor. So I just always have him gathering more and more hides and pieces of creatures to, you know, hint that, oh, maybe this will turn into a fantasy armor episode as well. I do think a Minecraft fantasy armor episode could be fun. Though I do kind of want to do a third episode of Minecraft superheroes first, because I really like that series and... I haven't used a lot of the big names yet because, as I said, when I started doing the Minecraft Super Heroes episodes, I didn't want to double up on any Minecraft mobs that I'd used in the Fantasy series, so I haven't used the Creeper and a whole bunch of other cool mobs that could make great superheroes or villains. But none of that is design notes for this creature, so let's get back to that. Uh, yeah, I kind of just made it look a bit like a blue whale. I don't know why that came to mind, but it really did. And then, you know, textured this thing a lot, had a lot of fun with making the lava below it look really glowy and having it look really goopy and thick as the legs are moving through it. And then, of course, lit this creature from below because a lot of the lighting is coming from the lava. For a drawing that took less than two hours, I'm very happy with this one, and I think it's a good one to end the episode with. Let's take a look. Commonly when I've visited the Mining Colony Isles, I've followed or been guided by the captain of the island guard, Stephen the Bold. On my latest return, however, I went seeking two explorers I'd just recently read about. They were called Lady Agnes and Sir Jens, who'd lived on the Colony Isles for decades studying the creatures and terrain. I hoped they could enlighten me further about more of the beasts to be found on these mysterious isles. They lived off in the mountains and only occasionally interacted with the surrounding villages, so it took some time to locate their home, but when I finally spotted their isolated log cabin, I was immediately faced with a creature I'd never seen on the Isles before, though one that resembled somewhat the Iron Guard Sentinels, golems built to protect the villages. The stone golem that I saw here was much smaller, standing at roughly 5 feet tall, it wore a red and yellow skirt and held out before it a red scarf, above which was floating a top hat. Admittedly, I would have believed it to be some form of statue if its head hadn't turned briefly in my direction upon my arrival before settling back into a resting state. Upon meeting Agnes and Jens and telling them of my reason for visiting, I noticed that they had many more of these golems, holding forth various household items and articles of clothing. They informed me that these were household tote golems. They used to be more common on the Isles, and many homes would have them to simply hold or carry items around for their masters, but the combination of spells and forging materials to create them had been lost some time ago. The ones in and around their cabin were ones they'd found over the years, exploring abandoned homes of the Isles. Jens and Agnes were in the process of trying to recover or rediscover the formula. Thus far, all they'd found was that the creatures were carved from tuff, a form of rock made from condensed volcanic ash. Beyond that, they hadn't yet had much luck. Still, they seemed confident that they could once more make them a common part of life on the Isles, and their optimism had me fairly convinced. Now, one thing you might notice pretty quickly from this first drawing and this episode in general, that the quote-unquote monsters I'm making aren't so monstery this time around. Obviously, in past episodes of Minecraft Mobs as Fantasy Monsters, I could pick a variety of different mobs to use, some that are a bit more menacing, some hostile ones, some that are on the more friendly side. With this one, obviously, you know, I was very happy to do this topic using the ones for the vote, but that meant I was limited to the ones from the vote, which aren't particularly hostile or monstery. Anyway, I was really excited to do this one and have 
have it kind of standing outside of a house, have the house kind of off to the side like a cabin. I thought about having it inside and having it in front of a window so we can still have a nice nature environment in behind it. But at the end of the day, I was just kind of like, I like this idea of having it standing next to a house. We can still have a bit of the log cabin in there, and it also helps give this creature a sense of scale. One other thing you'll likely notice if you saw the animations for the tough golem is that it kind of like lifts up its skirt to carry things around. And that in the context of the cartoony style animation that they made for it with a very simple style and in the context of Minecraft would probably look fine, but making a sort of more fleshed out not realistic, but more realistic looking creature. I thought it was gonna look kind of weird having this thing kind of like flipping up its skirt to hold stuff. It would almost look like it's flashing people or something. So I just decided, okay, let's add a scarf that it holds out over its hands above which stuff is levitating. I'm very happy with this piece. It's, you know, like I said, not a monstery one. It's a little bit more peaceful and serene, but that was kind of a nice change of pace. After having tea and exchanging some tales of our research and adventures, Lady Agnes and Sir Jens informed me of another creature that once roamed these lands in abundance. It was a species long thought to be extinct, but around three years ago, they'd found a preserved egg of one of these creatures at the bottom of a lake and managed to help it hatch. They brought me farther up the mountain to where the creature now roamed. It appeared to me somewhat like a blend of a wild boar and a dragon turtle, though more calm and peaceful than either of those specific beasts. From feet to the peak of its shell, it stood roughly 7 feet tall, though they claimed it was likely to reach 12 feet when fully grown. They called it the Sniffing Terraria Pin. It was a peaceful beast that wandered the hills smelling for seeds, then digging them up and moving them to another location where it believed the plants more likely to thrive as they grew. The creatures essentially acted like gardeners for the whole of the isles, and when they weren't working to help the forests and foliage flourish, they were simply smelling the flowers or napping in the warm daylight sun. The creature certainly looked as though it could have been dangerous if its instincts drove it to be so, but more likely I imagined if threatened, the creature would simply tuck itself into its moss-coated shell to stay safe. Agnes informed me that they were eagerly searching for more eggs, hoping to revitalize this species and once more establish them as a mainstay of the Isles. Though, only time would tell if this would be possible. I certainly hoped for their success. Now, the Sniffer is my personal favorite of the three mob options, though I am a fan of all three of them and would be happy with any of them winning, but this was the drawing I did first because you know, as I said, it's my favorite, but also the fact that it's the one that I felt like I could lean into being the most monstrous. But even with that in mind, as I started drawing it, I was thinking about making it a little bit more menacing looking, but it just didn't really feel right. Once I gave it the droopy eyes and a little bit of a grin, I was like, you know what, I can make this a bit more of a peaceful creature. I, I had genuinely thought about making all three of these into more monstrous and horrifying creatures, but I was just like, nah, you know what, let's lean into the peaceful side of this a little bit. As referenced in the lore, I was taking inspiration from designs of dragon turtles, looking at images of wild hogs and wild boars, and then I was also looking at images of Galapagos tortoises, kind of seeing how their skin moved and how their different parts had different kinds of scaly bits. And I think those all helped to flesh this out into the creature it ends up being, which I'm quite happy with. One thing that I think could have been nice is since I've got that dug hole in front of it, having a bit of dirt falling off its face, because in the animations for this one they show that it, you know, digs its face into the ground to dig holes and look for seeds. But once I was well into the rendering stage and thought about adding that, having the dirt kind of dripping off it, I was just kind of like, I've already got a fair amount of texture on its face, I think that's just gonna muddy it up too much. So I decided to just leave it out, and I think that was the right call, even if it could have added a little bit more extra movement to the piece. Overall, I'm very pleased with this fun, droopy-eyed, cute little sniffer guy, and I hope you all like it as well.
Upon learning of their efforts to return the sniffing terraria pin and the household tote golems to prominence, I asked if there were any other creatures Sir Jens and Lady Agnes were actively working towards the recovery of. In response, they guided me to an old mine near their home that was rarely used anymore, though if you sought through its tunnels far enough, you could connect into some of the currently active mines. After searching through for about 20 minutes, we spotted a green creature perched up on some rocks. My hand met the hilt of my blade on instinct, but they assured me this creature would not harm us. Immediately after we sighted it, it ran off deeper into the mines. We kept after it, finding it knelt between a set of stalagmites before it ran off once more. They claimed this was perfectly normal behavior, and we kept after it. Finally, we found the creature clinging from a stalactite above, but this time it dropped down and approached us. It was a creature that was heavily humanoid in appearance, despite its obvious oddities. It had seaweed-like foliage growing from its head, green fur coating much of its body, and digitigrade legs that ended in hoofed feet. But it also carried with it a large old backpack. It approached us and pulled from its bag an item that should not have been able to fit in the bag so easily. It was a pickaxe with purple lightning sparking off of it. Agnes and Jens told me I could take it, that it was a gift. They told me this creature was the Rascalian Mountain Gifter. It was a being they discovered, searching through these caves, that they were still uncertain if it had been part of a full species at some point, or if it was a unique mystical individual. Anytime they had sought after it and found the creature three times in a row, it would then pull an enchanted item from its bag and grant it to them. The creature could not speak and had a very playful and mischievous demeanor, so it was difficult to keep it still long enough to study it, but they were determined to decipher its history and origins. The three creatures I saw on this journey to the Isles were currently the main focus of Lady Agnes and Sir Jens's time, but they extended a warm, open-ended invitation for me to return any time to see what new discoveries they'd made and what new creatures or regions they'd turn to studying next. Now with this one, the thing I was most excited to do was the lighting for it, because I knew I could have some fun with it based on the animation that I was referencing for the rascal. In the little animation they did for it as a potential mob to be voted on, it pulls a glowing purple pickaxe out of its backpack. So I thought, well, that's perfect. I'll use a glowing purple pickaxe as the lighting source for the piece. I knew that would end up making it a little bit like the lighting in the warden drawing that I did in the last Minecraft Mobs as Fantasy Monsters episode, only it was being lit by its stomach. I think the lighting worked out a little bit better in the warden drawing than in this one, or not necessarily better, it was just a little bit more interesting. I feel like I gave this one a little bit too much ambient light, which I think I put in to make sure this creature, you know, wasn't too coated in shadow and hidden away, especially because it's not supposed to be a more menacing kind of one. So I think the lighting ends up just looking a little bit more generic than exciting, but I don't think that ruins the piece or anything, it just you know, wasn't quite what I thought was going to happen going into it. I was still quite pleased with this one. I wasn't sure exactly how I wanted to texture it. You can see that I gave it the digitigrade legs, the, you know, bendy backwards wolf, horse, whatever kind of legs. I also added a tail to it just to give it a few more monstery kind of qualities and not just have it be some green person that wanders around in the caves. And overall, while this piece doesn't like wow me or anything, I am pretty pleased with it. I think it's a good one to end this video on. Let's take a look. I hope you all enjoyed that compilation, and if you want more Minecraft stuff, as mentioned, I've recently done Minecraft mobs as Xenomorphs and a bunch of other Minecraft stuff, but I highly recommend the Xenomorph episodes. But that's all for today, except for leaving you with a positive or inspiring note, and this one is paraphrased from a guy named Guy Sangstock, who I recently heard talking about the difference between judgment and discernment, and he said essentially that when you discern, you are avoiding making a judgment call about who a person is for one action or thought or belief they have. Essentially avoiding calling someone a bad person just because you disagree with one thing about them. Discerning over judging keeps you more open to have conversations with people you disagree with, and you'll likely end up finding that you actually have a lot of common ground with those people. I hope that's inspiring, I love you all, and I'll see you all when I'm back from vacation. Goodbye.